To our participants today, we welcome your questions and comments. Please type them in the Q&A feature or the chat pod, and we will respond to them after the webinar presentation. Tomorrow, you will be emailed a link to a short, voluntary, confidential survey that we hope you will take the time to fill out. It helps us bring these free educational webinars to you. The email will also include Amy's contact information if you have questions and comments after the webinar is over. For those of you wanting CEUs, this email will be especially important as it gives information on how to obtain CEUs for viewing this live webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing later on the EAB University page of the emeraldashbor.info website. Thank you for attending today. And Amy, please unmute your mic and begin your presentation. All right. Thank you, Robin. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. All right. Well, I want to begin by thanking Emerald Ashbor University for the opportunity to present today as part of this virtual series. While the focus will be using the spotted lanternfly to share approaches and messages about outreach and engagement, I've also looked back into the past using some other examples of invasive insect species to share some additional examples that I've learned from and then have helped me become a better engaged, I guess be better to engage specific audiences and hopefully encourage others to learn more and become part of this invasive species army. While each invasive species can be a little bit different, um, that call to action may also be a little bit different, but the process is the same. So we're going to go ahead and get started. So I am coming from a state that was watching spotted lantern, the spotted lanternfly situation evolve over time. I was able to connect with others from Pennsylvania and other states to learn more from their experiences. And in the fall of 2018, was able to actually visit Pennsylvania as part of our Buckeye Environmental Horticulture Team study tour to Pennsylvania and New York. You know, you can learn a lot about a topic, and I'm sure we've all heard um, and seen spotted lanternfly uh, presentations about the life cycle and biology and management. But often it isn't until you see it that it really adds another component of learning and ultimately sharing. I used to joke that in the early days of Emerald Ash Borer, that tourism was up in places like Michigan and cities like Toledo because there was something to say about people wanting to see an infestation firsthand. So today, we're really gonna focus on those outreach and educational tactics, I guess. Um, and what I've included are some session objectives. So I'd like to begin by identifying what I would like to cover, and hopefully these objectives are some of the things that resonate with you and that you want to hear more about. So we're going to talk about shared experiences by using SLF and other invasive species. Uh, we really can learn so much from others that have really gone before us. And so, you know, you may think, well, why isn't there someone from Pennsylvania giving this? Because they've had so much more experience than, in, than you. Uh, but what I found is it's nice to get that perspective from a state that in the beginning didn't have it, but was learning. And then now we have some infestations that we're dealing with and, and managing or trying to manage. And how does that evolve and change the messages? And so it's kind of a different perspective. We're gonna talk about who are your outreach partners? Who can you bring to the table? Um, or maybe you're being invited to the table um, to talk about SLF um, on maybe a, you know, county basis, a regional basis, a statewide basis. But often, you know, the message can be stronger when we have more partners saying the same message. Who are your audiences? And so I would love if you have the opportunity or would like to, is to have individuals that are on the call today, um, type in at least one audience that you have are already identified. So if you could add that into the chat box, I'll kind of keep an eye on that and, and keep referring back to and looking, because that also helps me tailor the presentation today for what you're looking for. 
And of course, you can have multiple audiences. What is your message or messages that you are getting ready um, and realizing that those messages can evolve or change over time? One message that I have for everyone is to interact and stay up to date. Um, you know, we could end our session today and some of the information that I'm presenting could already be out of date. It can be frustrating as things can change so fast, but people have to be alerted to that and it will really help everybody involved. And so whenever I'm doing a presentation, I kind of like to start out with that message um, just to make sure that people understand, okay, they're not seeing it today and that's gonna be the end of the story that things are gonna change. Then what's your next step? Uh, you know, and this may be different for each one of you on the call. Um, you know, it may be to make a social media post about SLF within the week. It could be to, you know, start talking about having a meeting, developing a plan or checking out a website. Um, and so hopefully you'll leave with at least one task at hand to kind of help with the outreach and engagement of Spotted Lanternfly in your own situation. And this really kind of leads right into it, but how will you stay up to date? Um, you know, don't rely on someone else. Um, maybe schedule a reoccurring task in your calendar to spend 15 minutes, you know, a week, you know, looking on the internet for the latest news about Spotted Lanternfly. Maybe take that time to read about some research that's going on in one of the states that is currently being impacted. Um, you know, schedule a time to check in with somebody whose life kind of revolves around Spotted Lanternfly or, or follow them on social media to kind of stay up to date on the, the latest and the greatest. But again, that's really important information. So no matter the pest, identification of the audience and the message that you want to communicate is really that first step in developing successful outreach and engagement opportunities. We know that those, these messages will change over time and you may personally be managing multiple messages at the same time if you've got different audiences. You know, there can be also other state agency and organizations that have their own message. And so can you bring those together um, to, to give one message that's out um, in, for all of you to be part of? I know in Ohio, our Department of Agriculture began hosting a bi-weekly virtual meeting on Spotted Lanternfly even before the insect was detected in Ohio. The meetings included individuals from ODA, from USDA, our Ohio Department of Natural Resources, Division of Forestry, OSU Extension, um, our Ohio Grape Industry Committee, and um, there was a, a strong interest in the Cle from the Cleveland Metro Parks. And so each organization or agency brought something to the table. Um, and this group is commonly referred to as the Ohio's SLF cooperative group. The value of the group approach is that each member comes from a little different place and their responsibilities are charged when working with invasive species is now on the table. And so added into that discussion. And so it's time for each group to, um, you know, give an update of what's going on, maybe where they need help or assistance, but probably most importantly is just the engagement of working together and being on that same page. And no matter what the invasive species is, we can learn from each other and support each other, you know, along this journey or along this way. So before I really dive into Spotted Lanternfly um, and Ohio's experiences so far, I mentioned that I was going to take a look back at how maybe experiences in the past helped shape at least my future or our futures. And probably my first experience with invasive species was in the mid 90s when we had a gypsy moth outbreak in Northwest Ohio. And while many of you have may have already experienced the gypsy moth, um, there's a lot to learn from that caterpillar eating machine. You know, early in the infestation, we took a look around to see, you know, who are other people, where were other communities and areas that were steps ahead of us. And we actually brought in those experts, those that could share their experiences. And we did it in a way that we had a pretty large public program with these experts sharing their experiences. But it was very, um, kind of 
moderated and handled because then afterwards we took questions um, kind of on a one on one, a smaller format where we had tables around the outside of the room. And so we did this specifically that maybe one or two people wouldn't be able to take over the conversation or you know share their experience. And sometimes people were quite angry, um, but we kind of diffused that by doing this one-on-one -on -one after the initial message was sent. And so here's my message that I learned about spotted lanternfly, or excuse me, about gypsy moth that I've also added to my um, spotted lanternfly experience. And so, you know, we know that um, gypsy moth is, is a tree issue, but it's also a people issue. And so um, it can be a concern in, in forested areas and in highly populated urban areas. But what we wanted to do is have this meeting uh, with the experts who've lived it and experienced it, but we wanted it to be a positive experience. We wanted those uh, people in the seats to walk away from um, learning more about the insect um, and hopefully diffusing any tempers that were associated with the, with the outbreak. And so what we did is had the meeting and after the meeting, um, we had those conversations. And I just want to share about that conversation and how it's really stuck in my mind. And I really remember that. And so the individual was actually asking about, hey, they had a lot of oak trees. They wanted to plant trees in their, um, their landscape. And, you know, I was reading up and learning all about gypsy moth. And when I was doing the literature review, I noticed that, hey, ash trees are not a favorite host of gypsy moth. And so when they asked that question, I was excited that, hey, I knew that information and said, well, you know, you may want to consider an ash tree. It should do well in your soil site. And, and that was kind of the end of the conversation. And so it wasn't until years later, um, actually at an Emerald Ash Borer meeting, that that same individual came up to me and said, hey, you said that I should plant ash trees and I planted a bunch of them and now they're being infested by emerald ash borer. And so that light bulb to me was, okay, how do I really plan my words, right? I thought he was maybe gonna re, you know, add one tree and so now he's added a ton of trees and really think about plant diversity as part of that message, no matter what invasive species we're talking about. The other thing that I always like to try to tie in is, you know, the invasive species is kind of the ugly side of horticulture. And so I always like to try to tie in the beautiful side um, into messages. And I've come to learn that plant phenology and growing degree days is often a great way that this can be accomplished. So sharing that correlation of blooming red buds and hatching um, gypsy moth caterpillars hopefully encourages the public to look for the caterpillars when populations are small and in, in, in preparation uh, before there's outbreaks and there's you know, issues um, in their landscape and in that forest that they reside in. And yes, it can be challenging because often people don't pay attention until there's a crisis, um, but I continually try to think of ways to communicate messages about invasive species before they become a problem. And I'm going to leave this pretty photo up. Um, again, there's just all sorts of, of studies and stories that we can relate to invasive species. Um, and often it's just the, the little updates that we maybe put in a news release that we're writing or a column that we author in a local paper um, or even just on our, our Facebook page. But just to make sure that people are aware and alert and, and hopefully they'll dig deeper, um, but keeping it on the surface and in front of everybody. So speaking of emerald ash borer, uh, I'd also want to share a quick experience with this tree killing invasive species that I hope might be helpful too. You know, outreach messages can change over time. And so early in my time with emerald ash borer, management efforts were really focused on eradication. And so it was early on, people were learning everything there, there was to know about that insect and management, uh, realizing the devastation that was occurring and hoping that maybe we could eradicate it before that threat spread. And one of the messages that we communicated very early on 
was do not treat ash trees, that treatments are not 100% effective. And so not to treat the trees, um, trees that are treated aren't safe from eradication efforts. And I guess looking back, we were really good at communicating that message because as we moved on from that, from eradication efforts to management efforts, there was an unintended message that actually people grasp onto that pesticides don't work, which is totally untrue. Uh, but when people heard that they shouldn't be treating their trees, that they're not 100% effective, they didn't realize that you didn't have to be 100% effective to, to, to save and protect your trees. And so we had a really hard time when we changed from eradication efforts to management efforts to get that word back out because people thought that pesticides didn't work. And so we had our work cut out for us to, to make sure that we were communicating that yes, pesticides do indeed work. And I mention this just because, you know, messages do change. And so if we can proactively think about that. So right now we're gonna talk about this in our messaging, but you know, as spotted lanternfly gets closer, we're gonna have to adjust and change. And so I hope I'm just opening your eyes just a little bit to things that sometimes could happen if we don't have that, that planned out. I wanna talk about one more insect before I return to spotted lanternfly. And so the Asian longhorn beetle is a little different from these other insects that I've mentioned um, because their eradication story has been successful in many ways. And so there are efforts that are continued in Ohio, New York, Massachusetts, and now South Carolina with the goal of elimination uh, from North America, our fingers are crossed. Um, there isn't a lot of wiggle room when it comes to messaging about Asian longhorn beetle. You know, it's about learning the insect, what to look for, looking for it, and then reporting any suspect insects or situations. You know, there's an extra layer of outreach efforts um, that could be focused on lookalikes because once people are out there looking, uh, we, they tend to report things that they think might be the insect we're looking for but it could be something else. Um, and so really, again, focusing those efforts and managing that discussion. Um, I think that everybody that I work with um, and I've talked to would rather have 100 reports of something that's not Asian longhorn beetle, rather than someone not reporting it in a population beginning to grow um, and becoming more problematic. And so the same would be true with spotted lanternfly, especially in areas where it's not known to currently exist. And so this point really leads me to a great transition. So whenever I talk about any invasive, um, I, but especially those that we're encouraging individuals to look for new populations or monitoring the spread of any existing population, it is important that we need more eyes in the sky and feet on the ground. Um, you know, invasive species typically are found by the public, by green industry professionals, by somebody managing property. USDA, our, our state departments of agriculture, universities, agencies, and organizations that partner, um, you know, are usually short staffed. And so we need the help of others. And so this is why it's so important that each one of us has a role in outreach and education and being part of that scouting and monitoring for these invasive species. So, but back to spotted lanternfly. Sorry, I sometimes diverge a little. Um, I wanna share this slide for a couple reasons. One, it's a great place to start. But two, it's a great piece that was created by Penn State Extension. You know, always look for those that are ahead of us or ahead of you. Um, utilize their efforts and what they're willing to share. Of course, give credit when credit's due and ask if you're gonna do some modification, you know, so it fits your brand or your state. Um, but this is kind of the beginning, right? And so making sure that people are familiar with the life cycle. 
And I'm assuming that a lot of you have already been through Spotted Lanternfly training. Um, and if not, there are a lot of virtual recorded programs that are out there that dive in a little bit deeper about the life cycle and biology. But we're gonna be focusing really on the messaging related to that. So in, in Ohio, um, in 2020, it was the year. Over the summer, there were some individual hitchhikers that uh, always were tied to someone coming from an infested area into Ohio that were reported. Uh, the good news is that they were reported. And the better news is that those individuals were not tied to a reproducing population. So there was a parent who was visiting a son there was a delivery driver who noticed an unwanted guest in his cab before he opened that door when he got to Ohio. Uh, there were reports of spotted lanternfly adults at a truck stop um, near one of the, the fuel pumps. But again, thankfully, those reports were just that, reports of individuals and not a reproducing population. But later that fall in 2020, there was a citizen from Jefferson County, which is in Southeast Ohio, who recently read an article in a local paper about spotted lanternfly. And a business owner um, next to him actually brought over this insect and said, hey, look what we found. And he knew right away that, that this was spotted lanternfly and this was something serious and something that needed to be reported. And so it was that article that was written, um, that means of outreach that alerted that gentleman to be on the lookout. And so it just happened within that same week that somebody brought it to the, his attention. And so it was success, right? This is friend and colleague, um, Emily Schwackheimer from Penn State, um, standing next to a circle trap. You know, several agencies and universities have deployed traps for several years um, when populations got near to Ohio um, and populations have actually been discovered um, or picked up in one of the, in a couple of those traps. Um, and so this is a way to engage individuals, right? And so, you know, this is the next step. So sometimes we say, you know, just get out there and look. But some people actually want like a purpose or a place to go. And so putting up a trap um, that they could revisit through the season, especially for adult activity when it becomes more evident or obvious, um, you know, check out the videos on how to create your own trap or make your own trap and kind of make it a community event or opportunity. Keeping track of where those are, are really important. So whether it's a visual survey or actual traps, ODA has tried really hard to update maps with these points and share with groups that, okay, this is where we have individuals looking for spotted lanternfly either as a visual survey location or through a trap. Uh, this map is actually um, from 2020, so that year that we had our first detection. Um, we realize that more people are looking, but there is such a value to know where they're looking and communicating that value is important. So it's not just to say, hey, get out there and look, but let us know where you're looking because that can be pretty helpful. So here's a map that um, is dated October 19th, 2021 from New York's IPM program. And I wanna point out, and it may be difficult to see on the screen, but there are these purple dots. And so it's pretty large dot right here um, where it indicates what that means, but there are, there are scattered throughout. Um, and it is important, those dots are not reproducing populations, but those individuals that were found just like I had explained um, in Ohio and in, in several sites, especially early in 2020. And so, you know, we know that spotted lanternfly has been identified in the state, but what's next? Or maybe you're from a state that hasn't identified spotted lanternfly yet, but what can you do? And really increasing that awareness, encouraging engagement, 
Um, I love this, join the battle, beat the bug. Um, how can you encourage people to be part of this? And so we can likely agree that Spotted Lanternfly is in other places. Uh, we just haven't found it yet. Um, and that first step is to identify those potential audience who are gonna be able to help us. And so we found in Ohio that green industry professionals are key. They are folks that are out in the, the, the landscape. And while they're managing sometimes for Alanthus, which is one of the preferred hosts, uh, we've encouraged them to be looking for signs and symptoms of spotted lanternfly. I kind of look as outreach as a path. And so, you know, those steps include just general outreach and awareness. It may lead to discovery, which then would lead to additional survey work in that particular area. All at the same time, research is going on and they're implementing the findings of that research to see how it works in the management side of things. There's always more outreach and awareness. So that's kind of ongoing. There's an evaluation, what's working, what's not working. Um, states choose to make adjustments. Um, of course, there'll be more discoveries. And so this path continues. And sometimes we like to think of it as a straight path. Uh, but sometimes we're going around in circles for a little bit um, until we kind of get that direction. And so how can you, um, you know, what's your path? What's your path for outreach going to be where you're from? We do know that spotted lanternfly was discovered for the first time in the fall of 2014 in eastern Pennsylvania. Um, this map shows the, the spread three years into the infestation. So I want everybody to think back. So this was um, in 2017. You know, what were you doing in 2017 as it related to spotted lanternfly? Uh, did you hear about spotted lanternfly? Did you know it existed? Did you know they were dealing with it in Pennsylvania? You know, of course, it's going to be different for each person, uh, where you live, where you work, how far you were from these infested counties. Um, and what else was on your plate? Was spotted lanternfly just not a priority yet? But as time progressed and these areas um, may be getting closer to you, you know, what are you thinking about now in 2019 as it relates to spotted lanternfly? I had mentioned those purple dots in that, uh, that first map that I showed you. And if you think back, there weren't these kind of goldenrod colors on that map. Um, and so they've kind of evolved or changed from the goldenrod was those individual uh, finds, uh, which now then are the purple dots. And so I just wanted to, if you kind of go back into history and oh, well, what's the difference between those two, uh, that indeed is what it is. Not in Ohio yet. Um, so this is January um, 2nd of 2020, but look where it's known to be. And at this point, it was knocking on Ohio's doors. And so we were doing a lot of outreach prior to those fines um, in Western Pennsylvania, uh, but this really brought it to our attention. Um, and we got really serious about not just reaching the people who are interested in spotted lanternfly, but those kind of the general public across the whole state. And so you can see, um, this is February, 2021, Ohio is officially on the map. Um, again, what are the messages at that point where you're living at, where you're working at? Um, we also discovered at this point, there's different messages that we have to have in Ohio. So there's messaging that we're focusing on people that are in Jefferson County that are living near the, the known infestation. And then the messages across the state. Um, and so again, still really focusing on early detection um, and reporting what they're seeing. So if you live in Pennsylvania, when you look at this map, uh, your messages might have changed dramatically as new counties were added to this map. And so you can see it's kind of almost a, a ribbon effect going now from the, the western part of the, the, the state all the way to that initial infestation in the eastern part. And then the latest map, 
And so, you know, things have changed again. Another state's been added to the mix. And I noticed a lot of people from Indiana on today's call. So Ohio was no longer the furthest point west. And now there are Ohio counties that are closer to a known infestation because of that Indiana find than they were when it was in Jefferson County. So even if your state is not on the map, how can spotted lanternfly education and outreach occur even before it arrives? You know, get, get, into there, get into it before it's been detected because it probably will lead to those early detections. So let's get back to the information about the insect. Um, and so, you know, clearly identifying things and, and points that people can take away. So how can you introduce spotted lanternfly to identified audiences, even if spotted lanternfly might not be on their radar. You know, what does that look like? Um, and I really have found that you kind of break it up seasonally. So if spotted lanternfly were to be found, what stage of the insect is, is it? What should you be looking for now? Um, and even just small posts about that. Hey, you know what? We had a really hard freeze the other night which would impact the adults here in an area. And so now we're really going to transition to a lot of our efforts focusing on looking for those egg masses. A little humor can sometimes help. While not everybody can pull it off, I have to say one of my colleagues, Joe Boggs, has a knack at photo editing and incorporating said images into his presentations and articles that he authors. While there has to be some caution um, and you want to make sure that the audience isn't taking away the message that the insect truly is that large, um, you know, it sometimes gives people a reason to smile, especially when we're talking about these threats that can sometimes be a little depressing. Photographs from the field, whenever you can take them yourself or use them with when um, use others with credit is really important. Local photos, I think, especially resonate. Um, you know, getting out to see spotted lanternfly in the field if you have that opportunity. So I have a question to pose. Am I the only one on this Zoom that has done a side trip while on a family vacation to check out an invasive species where they're traveling to or through? Of course, being very careful not to return with any of those hitchhikers, uh, but I joke with people that I, that I work with that I use the early detection and, and distribution maps, the EDD maps, that could be an overlay map for when I plan a family vacation. Um, and so if you're traveling to an area for other reasons, but spotted lanternfly is there, you know, take that opportunity while you're that close to try to take in the sights and, and, and see what people are experiencing from that other location. Also, sometimes illustrations like this can be really helpful, you know, when explaining how spotted lanternfly feed. And so using those in signage or presentations. This is one of my favorite photos. It's actually taken by the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. And, you know, we talk about how beautiful the insect is and how, you know, it's eye catching. Uh, but how many spotted lantern flies can you find on the screen right now? And I think if I counted correctly, um, it's 11 adults. So they can kind of camouflage in too. So I always try to, to let people know that, okay, yes, they're, they're beautiful. They're sometimes obvious, but they can also camouflage themselves. This image, um, many of you might know about Bugwood. Um, it's an image database that there are over 300,000 images on over 27,000 subjects taken by over 2,500 photographers. And so I mention this just because it's a great resource. Uh, but also if you're a fabulous photographer and you have images that you could share that would be helpful to others, that's really important. And so um, if you go to images.bugwood.org, if you're not familiar, um, you know, I just wanted to, to give a shout out to, to that website and, and the information that's available. Because sometimes we can't 
I'll get photos that we need, you know, in our outreach efforts. But if you need those for educational purposes, they are, they are available. I had mentioned, um, you know, right now we're kind of transitioning to really focus um, and message that we need people out to look for um, egg masses, both on trees and plant parts, but also on any flat surface, right? And so we want to make sure that that message is loud and clear. Another message that we like to get out during the winter is the, the progression or the transition of how that egg mass looks. So very different in the fall to early winter through the, um, you know, as it's kind of aged, it breaks up, almost kind of appears as mud uh, later into the, the late winter, early spring. Another kind of interesting fact and something that you can really grab onto and promote and, and get the word out about are other things to look for beyond just spotted lanternfly. And so, you know, when we have insects feeding as they pull out the, the piercing, mucky, uh, piercing sucking mouth parts, you can see the sap running uh, from, you know, very small, um, to you know, covering a majority of that, that tree trunk there. Uh, but hey, if people notice that, you know, their eyes should be drawn, they should be looking for additional information. And so that sap leads to, or, or honeydew in some cases, leads to black sooty mold, which then leads to an increase of activity sometimes with our wasp and hornets that are drawn in. Um, and so you know, if people are seeing this, um, you know, they're familiar with wasp and hornets, but if, if it's unusual that they're in mass like that, well, what else is going on? I had mentioned uh, really trying to focus on different parts of or times of the year and what people should be looking for. And Penn State um, has created this, and I really think that it's a, a good resource to continue to promote. And so, you know, it breaks it down by eggs, nymphs, and adults, and when especially with that overlapping area, you're gonna be looking for each one. And I think that it's important to mention that, you know, the egg masses really could be responsible for the longest stage of the insect, but then also for the movement of this insect at great distances. And so, you know, wherever egg masses are laid this fall, um, wherever that egg mass ends up next year, um, potentially is going to be another infestation. You can see here the nymphs in the center and then really talking um, about the adults. And so they are the largest. They're often most obvious. That's what typically we get reports of. Uh, they are weak flyers. Um, they are responsible for some localized spread and can be responsible for some occasional hitchhikers. Other messages that we can communicate are preferred host, like Alanthus or Tree of Heaven, and of course, grapes. We can share where we know this insect is once it um, becomes established in our state, uh, which encourages other people in that general vicinity to get out and looking. And so there's individuals that might ha not have looked otherwise, but now that, oh my gosh, it's near me, it's in my backyard, um, I really need to take this serious and get out um, and take a look. And so those were just two maps uh, from, from Google that I pulled up of the infestation that was found in um, Cuyahoga County or Cleveland earlier this year. Audiences can be wide and, and vary. And you may have a specific audience uh, with your job role um, that you're going to address. Um, or you may have to be creative and think, OK, how many audiences can I reach? And so whether it's the backyard gardener, whether it's somebody who's managing parks, uh, public lands, cemeteries, it could be somebody that has an apple orchard or a vineyard. It could be somebody that um, is growing hops. It could be a woodland owner. And so kind of to tag on to that, um, it could be our maple producers um, and the, the syrup that's produced um, over the winter and tapped. And so it's a great opportunity uh, when they're out tapping trees to be looking 
for egg masses. The transportation hub, right? So our truck drivers, people that are moving products from place to place, uh, making sure that they're aware of you know, where that load started, maybe where they've traveled across or through, um, and then the final destination. And, you know, as they open up those doors, hey, take a look and see if they see something that's unusual, an insect that, you know, happened to be there, um, and collecting that pretty quickly um, just to determine, you know, what it is. Is it spotted lanternfly? Firewood dealers, uh, nursery growers, and then the, the whole camp, people that camp um, and potentially the threat of this insect and other invasive species being moved around as a vehicle. So, you know, take a look at your own map. And so this is a map of Ohio, but are there key interstates, highways, um, and how close are you to those areas? Um, are, are there opportunities for you to do educational blitzes at um, rest stops? And so as travelers come in, um, especially from the infested area, um, you know, raising awareness, but also getting that information out to everybody. Um, so again, we can raise awareness. And then railways. And so how close are you? And are there tracks that is just continuous movement? Are there areas where those trains stop for a while? Um, are there Alanthus and other host plants that if spotted lanternfly was hitchhiking, it would be just a, a perfect opportunity for that insect to jump off and begin establishing its own population. Now there is a warning. Um, I mean, we can't just all jump on the, the railways and, and start scouting for spotted lanternfly and be cautious of um, you know, the trains and, and the dangers that occur and private property issues as it relates to that. Uh, but often uh, you probably don't have to look very far to find an Alanthus or a tree of heaven near railroad tracks kind of in your area or in your neighborhood. This is a checklist. Uh, this is actually developed by the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. And just recently, Ohio Department of Agriculture has developed a similar checklist for individuals that are within the quarantine or maybe traveling through a quarantine of, of things to look before you move. And so this information is really good, not just for spotted lanternfly, but other invasives as well. And so um, if you don't have this for your state yet, um, this may be something to consider or taking information from that and including, including it in the messaging that you develop to get the word out. All right, uh, Virginia Cooperative Extension has done a couple lookalike. Um, and so if you're not familiar with those, um, these are great resources to have um, and maybe adapt for your own state's use with, of course, with their permission or just use as is. And so we have realized that once we get people out looking, any insect that may be new to them uh, may just a little look like spotted lanternfly, you know, they may think it. And, you know, when you have two right side by side, you can say, oh, yeah, I'm comparing it. It's not. But when you're out in the field without that comparison, you know, you may think, oh, this could be it. And so capturing the insect, capturing photos is really important. Additionally, they have a fact sheet that they've created on lookalikes for the egg mass. And so, um, you know, some are other egg masses, um, some are lichens on the bark of a tree that sometimes people could get confused with. Uh, but again, promoting this and highlighting those photos. In Ohio, we are proud um, card carrying members of kind of a variety of invasive species cards that we've developed. Um, and so we do have one for spotted lanternfly. Um, so there's some great photos. Um, it has the actual size of the insect and then also um, a QR code for more information. We've developed yard signs um, to encourage people to spot the spot um, and monitoring for host plants like Alanthus and grapes. 
And we're also really trying to get the word out about reporting those suspect finds. And so individuals can download the Great Lakes Early Detection Network app, especially if they're um, reporting other invasive species beyond just spotted lanternfly. Of course, you can always contact um, local extension offices. And whether it's the Great Lakes Early Detection, the extension office, um, all of those get directed to the Ohio Department of Agriculture in Ohio because they are the regulatory authority. And so they receive the Gledden app reports. They also have an online reporting system. They have a telephone number that you can call and talk to a real person um, or you can email. But what's really important, no matter what avenue you choose to report the infestation, we need to know the exact location have a photo or actual sample, and then of course your contact information. And so it's important to note that, um, you know, often we'll get phone calls that, you know what, last summer I know I saw that insect. And while that's, you know, good information, uh, we need something a little bit more concrete. And so, you know, trying to establish, uh, would it be an area where it would be prime because of a transportation hub or a rail yard that people would see them. Uh, but we also need the actual specimen. And so encouraging them to go back out to do a survey or in some cases, you know, people will be sent out to do survey work. Um, you know, have a camera. So, you know, have your, your cell phone if you can capture an image, if you can't quite reach it. Um, but you, you see it, so make sure that we have a really clear image um, because we don't want to be kind of chasing all these suspect reports that really aren't tied to an actual insect or it's just what somebody thinks that they saw. The other thing I want to address just real quickly here as we are kind of winding down is there are states that have developed these really clever um, campaigns or messages um, in their outreach and engagement. And Pennsylvania has a card, um, it's a little bit thicker that you actually use to scrape off egg masses. And so in Ohio, people have, um, you know, grabbed onto that and they've heard that message, but we are really trying to stress, yep, you can do that in areas that we know have known populations, but first in Ohio, we've got to report it. Then you can scrape, right? And so making sure that that message fits with the state and where you are in the process. There's the stomp and smash, uh, there's see it, stomp it. Um, and so again, people are hearing that, they're seeing it on social media, um, but in Ohio, we want to make sure in other states that you report it first. In addition to that detection um, and monitoring for spotted lanternfly, you know, there are other messages that we're trying to communicate as well. And so making sure that people aren't spreading spotted lanternfly either when they go and visit an infested state coming back or they're now in part of the, the state. So in Jefferson County and Cuyahoga County that they potentially could be moving it other places. Uh, we talk about removal of egg masses, but really to the point where you're looking for them. Um, and now in Jefferson and in um, Cuyahoga, that could be kind of added into that conversation piece, that messaging piece. Um, there are individuals who, you know, we talked about the traps are using sticky bands as a monitoring tool. Um, and so what are the pros and cons uh, with that? Um, people are always interested in biological controls and what research is, is showing um, us, as well as chemical controls. And I think it's important to share that there are chemical controls that are, that are, um, that are working, right? Um, they are successfully managing populations, uh, but in Ohio, that message, we don't want to get it out too strong because we don't want people treating for spotted lanternfly when spotted lanternfly isn't there. And so the, the value and the importance of knowing you know, what the pest is, identifying it, and then what those management options could be. Um, I just wanted to highlight, this is another um, thing from Penn State that talks about uh, the active ingredient of some of the insecticides that they're doing um, some work with. And we always get questions about toxicity to birds and fish and bees and, you know, 
this addresses that. And so, um, you know, really happy with uh, all the research and all the information that's coming out of the states that have larger populations uh, because it's information thing and things that we can share. So, you know, I was, I'm coming from a state that has been watching spotted lantern fly um, evolve over time. Um, and so it, it's interesting to me to watch, you know, as we heard about that first find and then as it's expanding in Pennsylvania and to other states and, and how we take that message, that opportunity to then, hey, it's a, another opportunity for a news story in Ohio. And so, yes, it's information about another state, but we need to be looking here. And so always taking that opportunity when you see something posted on Facebook or on social media, uh, making sure that it's reliable, it's a good source of information, but sharing that to again, increase awareness among people that follow you or watch your page. And so with that, I think we've got a little bit of time that um, if anybody has questions, if you want to type those in the chat box, that would be great. Um, if you have a, an audience that you think is in need of this information, um, you know, throw that up on the chat box. I did want to, I missed um, talking about this earlier in the presentation. We are really good at identifying audiences that we're comfortable with, that are receptive to our messages. But I encourage people to think of ways uh, to reach people that might otherwise not be interested in the topic. And probably the biggest success story that um, happened, and it was during Emerald Ashbor times, and it was, I'm not sure whose idea it originally was, but it was to tie um, ash and bats. And so they were doing outreach at some local baseball games, both, you know, at the national level, at, you know, state. Um, and so we did that with one of our baseball teams called the Toledo Mud Hens. And I was just shocked at the people that otherwise would not have learned about Emerald Ashbor, but because we came to them in an avenue or an event that they were familiar with, that they liked, they were able to take that information away. And so I always am challenging myself to identify what those opportunities are and how we can tie invasive species into something else. This has been great, Amy. Um, Cliff Sadoff is asking when sharing incidences of SLF, are there any privacy issues that need to be considered? Sure. So um, when, and I'll address it from the Great Lakes Early Detection app. Um, so there is an area on the app that you can click that you, if it's confirmed that that's what it is, it doesn't become um, public um, as far as a point on the map but it's always wonderful to see those maps and see where it is. And, um, and if it's detected and becomes a regulatory issue, uh, the, the Ohio Department of Agriculture obviously will um, come in and, and uh, work with the property owners, but implement management issues to hopefully reduce or eliminate um, that insect. So I hope I, I answered that, Cliff. Um, Tara wants to know what is the best way to destroy egg masses? Yeah, so um, that's a really good question. Um, and so you can see with some of the um, the work that's done in Pennsylvania, I mean, scraping them off and keeping them in an enclosed bag, um, smashing them, uh, putting them in a, um, a water solution with some soap. Um, also, there's some work being done um, on efforts to actually spray egg masses with a golden pest spray oil um, that then will, you know, stop or reduce the, the hatching the following year. Okay, if you scrape an egg mass off, how likely is it that any residue left behind will be viable? 
So really good question. And we've um, dealt with this a lot in Ohio with our with gypsy moth. And so it's not just scraping them off. Um, it's scraping and collecting or, main, or containing them uh, because you're absolutely right. If you scrape um, and, and miss part of the egg mass or the egg mass drops, um, you know, some of it will be less viable because they'll be exposed to winter temperatures uh, where it's kind of protected in that egg mass stage when they're all together. Um, but I have um, seen where homeowners have scraped egg masses, um, and this is specifically geared towards gypsy moth with, with that experience, uh, but they've done that in the spring and just scraped them off the tree and they fall into the ground and those have, um, have hatched. So you have to be to be careful that you're you're um, you know collecting them and not leaving that that residue or those eggs behind. Um, the other thing with egg mass removal is um, that's a great idea, and we can get egg masses that are within our reach, uh, but there are going to be plenty of other egg masses um, up higher in tree canopies, on you know utility poles, on buildings that we might not have access to, and so. Um, you know, it's, it's part of the toolbox, uh, but you're probably not going to manage a population simply by removing egg masses because you just can't get to them all. Okay. Can you suggest any social media to follow specifically to keep track of seasonal tips regarding spotted lanternfly? Thank you. Yeah, so um, I would definitely refer to um, the experts in Pennsylvania because they've been doing this the longest. Um, they have a great website uh, that is geared towards different audiences, so you can kind of dig deeper. And then, of course, they um, have the information that they also push out on, on Facebook and Instagram. And so I would connect at the, the website level for the university. Um, and then there's kind of a, a networking, of course, um, USDA, um, APHIS is also, you know, that layer getting information out. And so I think once you find that, that connection uh, with good, solid research-based information, um, that you'll, you'll see the linkages between those organizations and agencies. Okie dokie. I'm in Illinois and presumably we have no spotted lantern fly yet. What kind of prevention message can we, we be giving to Illinois residents at this time regarding spotted lantern fly? Absolutely. So, I mean, the first is that people can recognize it, right? And so if they're out and about and see something that's, you know, they suspect a spotted lantern fly at any of the stages, hey, I, I remember hearing about that. And so, you know, often they'll go to the computer maybe and do a search or find additional information, but at least it's on their radar. Um, I think another opportunity that we have, especially coming up, um, you know, with Thanksgiving and holiday travels is where those travels take us. And so, you know, are you going to an area that has an infestation? and or had an infestation and be aware of that. And so, you know, it's probably not too far um, off to say that, you know, there might be somebody from Illinois that travels to the Philadelphia area to meet family. And um, maybe there's something that, you know, a decorative pot that's outside in their landscape that they want to give to a family member. Um, you know, maybe there's a sentimental or some kind of connection there. But looking at that item that's been outside to make sure that it doesn't have any egg masses, right? That it's it's cleaned, it's been washed. And so it's just those kind of like stories or potential avenues of move the insect moving, you know, great distances are ways that you can kind of localize it. You can tell that story, you can personalize it and people can make that connection. Okay, sounds good. I am not seeing any more questions right now, but you will have a chance to, Amy's given you her um, contact info on the slide. You have a, So you have a chance to contact her after the webinar. 
and you all will be receiving more information tomorrow on how to um, get CEUs for being um, part of this presentation. And Amy, great job as always. And thank you so much for doing this. And I would like to thank ever, all our participants for being here. And at this point, I'm going to end the webinar and I want you all to have a great day. Thanks again, Amy. Hey, thanks, Robin.